Hello, everybody. Welcome to this We Did It Dot Health event. At We Did It Dot Health, we're working to create a healthy, happy, vegan, and plant-based world. We're doing that through building community and offer, offering resources such as today's discussion to help you create relationships where you plant seeds of hopeful curiosity in others when they ask about a vegan or plant-based lifestyle. Be sure to hit subscribe. And we also invite you to join our Facebook communities and check us out online. So you can support and encourage that with like-minded members. My name is Marikita Solis, and I'm very excited to welcome esteemed retired environmentalist Gerard Bishop from Australia, coming in from Australia tonight. So welcome, Gerard. Hi. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. joining us. This is brilliant. Yeah. I'm very excited about your presentation. And everyone, please give StreamYard permission to use your name and get your comments and questions there because we've got an expert right in front of us and we want to take advantage of his wisdom and his time so graciously coming to talk to us. So go ahead, um, Gerard. How, how long have you been plant based vegan? Oh, well, um, 30 years plus. Uh, yeah, 30 years odd. What um, inspired you? Oh, I had a health crisis. <laughs> but, um, yeah, a lot of crises. But crises are good, aren't they? You've got to use them uh, to your advantage. As we have now, we have multiple crises hitting us all at once. So um, this is a very useful time, I'd say, for change, for personal change. So um, That's a great way to look at that, everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. um, would you like me to head off on the on the presentation? Here we go. Yes, I'll let you take it over. Here we go. Great. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much for that. But so, what what I'm going to give you first is a bit of a background of me. I, I worked for government for decades, monitoring deforestation. So, I want to give you a flavour of what this deforestation looks like. More recently, I've been doing other work with Eating Our Way to Extinction, the documentary, and other uh, climate healers work. But um, this is how it all started uh, for me. Um, how do I get the next slide? This, the title of this is, Is This the End? Um, and it, that sounds pretty gloomy, but believe me, this is a positive talk. So um, uh, let's see. This will, uh, hmm, how am I? I don't see how you advance it. Um, you're in the PowerPoint? Yes, I, for some reason, the keyboard's not. Okay, I'll just, um, oh, here we go. Yeah, okay, so, <coughs> pardon me. Yeah, this is my brush with grass-fed beef. We used to crawl over our state of Queensland mapping deforestation. Um, to give you an idea of how big Queensland is, my state, um, it's about three times the size of Texas, so pretty big. Um, and we use satellite data and field data to monitor deforestation. And, and here I'll give you a flavour of what deforestation looks like industrial scale deforestation uh, this is how this is how uh, it's done in Australia they use two of the biggest bulldozers you can find these are d11 bulldozers 100 ton bulldozers and they string a chain between them like a big anchor chain each link in that chain is too heavy to lift and they just uh, uh, two two bulldozers with the chain between and they forge ahead and they, they pull over, they call it tree pulling, and they literally pull trees out of the ground. These trees can be uh, 20, 30 metres high, you know, up to uh, 80, 100 foot high, and they're just ripped out of the ground by these enormous bulldozers. Um, it's, called, it's called tree pulling. It was invented in Australia, and now it's used around the world uh, to great effect. These are smaller dozers uh, in America. These are D7s, but uh, same... put. See, the, the prong on the front of this is to push over the trees that are a bit di too difficult. But they, these, these are uh, dragging the chain behind them to, to uh, pull over the trees. 
This is in Florida. So that's what's happening in America right now. These are D8 bulldozers, 50 ton. Um, and this is in uh, Brazil, uh, where they're using the same chaining, they call it, or tree pulling uh, with dozers down there. So you can see this, this method is very efficient at, at, at uh, destroying forests. So uh, this is some early historic footage of how it was invented in Australia. They, had, they didn't have huge, powerful bulldozers, so they had this ball in the middle to lift the chain off the ground to give it more leverage to pull the trees out. So this is, uh, this is going back. What they do then is they, they, uh, uh, they, they knock the trees down, they, they rake it up into, um, into, into lines, and then they burn it, and they burn it, and they burn it, and they burn it until they get rid of it. This is a drip torch, they call it. This is used today. They even use drip torches out of helicopters today uh, or quad bikes. Uh, and then when they call it stick raking, they get rid of all the, the, the woody material and they burn again. And then they can plough and cultivate if they're doing that. But mostly this land is used for um, grazing land. <clears throat> or in Brazil, uh, that's how they, that's how they, uh, they do it. I won't uh, keep going with this. This is an animation of, um, of fire. But this gives you a, a better idea of what happens. You see, deforestation happens because of the fire, not so much as the logging or the or the tree felling. If you don't burn, that it'll it will revert to forest again if you leave it alone. So they burn and burn and burn repeatedly, and this is two ten day uh, 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 dry dry season satellite images where you see the orange and the red is the fire, and you see the world is burning. And Africa is the number one fire continent, followed by uh, South America. But also Australia burns, the whole of you, uh, Northern Europe burns. So we know now that agriculture causes 88 to 99% of deforestation. And, and what's the greatest driver of that um, agriculture? It's animal agriculture. In, in uh, Brazil and South America, the, the the, the home of deforestation at the moment, the Amazon and so on, 84% of that deforestation is for cattle grazing and for animal feed crops. Oh, by the way, all of this information I'm giving you is, is peer-reviewed material. So it's not controversial. It's all factual and you can go, and I've got the references there if you, if you want to chase them up. Uh, you can go and look at it yourself. So... When we deforest, when we take away the forest, the animals that live there, apart from a few, a few birds, um, the animals die. If you take away their home, they don't move to another home because animals are very territorial. It's all about food. So their territory is their support, their livelihood, their food, and they can't um, abide others Join, uh, 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 coming into their territory. So the, the animals that, that lived in that forest die. This is what regrowth looks like. Uh, this is in southern Australia. If you clear, the, this, this land was clear felled, right? They actually logged this land and used the timber, whereas they don't for most of the world. But um, this has been clear felled and then it's been left alone. It hasn't been burned. So what happens is that uh, regrowth happens and it, it you can tell that uh, an area is regrowth because all of the trees, all of the stems are the same size. In this case, it looks like this is about, uh, say, 20 year, 20 plus year regrowth. I want to talk to you a bit about our footprint and planetary boundaries. How we would, how we're doing on planet Earth? If you've read the WWF reports, you'll you'll notice that uh, they they say that you might have heard that if we all consumed like North Americans, we would need five planets Earths to support that consumption. Uh, you may have heard that. What does that mean exactly? Well, the planetary boundaries are the things that the systems that support life on Earth. 
And now there's a lot of science being done on how we're doing against these boundaries. Are there limits to these boundaries? And what are they? And have we overstepped those limits? Well, they've defined nine planetary boundaries. Uh, some of them are still unknown, um, but but this is the this is research that came out a month ago that shows that of the nine planetary boundaries, we've overstepped the limits of six of those boundaries. Now, the planetary boundaries are defined by if if we overstep any one planetary boundary, it endangers all life on Earth. Uh, it radically changes. So. Uh, things like climate change, things like uh, killing off the, bio, the biodiversity, uh, species loss, uh, deforestation, water, um, uh, pollution, uh, uh, nutrient pollution in the system, the oceans, the atmospheres, etc. So um, we've now overstepped six of the nine planetary boundaries. So we are in, we are skating on thin ice. We are well beyond the safe zone. So, so life on Earth is perilous right now. You might look out the window and think, oh, it's a lovely day. But, but the, 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 the systems that support our life on this planet are in a state of collapse. So um, I'll just mention a few of those. We'll, ju we'll just look at a few of those. Um, it's well known now that the, the, the global food production is the single largest driver of environmental degradation and transgression of planetary boundaries. So in other words, those, those uh, six planetary boundaries that I was just talking about, the greatest driver pushing them over the limit is food production. The current food system can only support half our population sustainably. What that means is that, um, well, what, what, what we're doing right now is effectively spending on our credit card past our limit of repaying. Um, we're drawing down the natural capital in the world to the point where um, we're going to reach a hard stop pretty soon. Um, but we're well beyond what the Earth can sustainably support us. So the, the, the thrust of this talk is that diet change is essential for a habitable planet. It's no longer a personal preference matter. So when we when we talk about someone, you know, you, you try not to stand on people's uh, uh, toes talking about diet. I mean, everyone gets very heated about diet, but pretty soon it's not going to be a personal preference. It's going to be a matter of life or death. And the reason why we have pushed our planet beyond its limits is not the number of people, believe it or not. It's the number of animals that we feed to feed the people. Where there is about 9 billion, uh, uh, well, you're getting up to 9 billion, but there's 90 billion animals that we feed that are killed each year for us to eat. Now, these are animals that um, they're growing fast. They've been bred to, to have extreme growth rates. So they don't eat like we do. They eat many times more in proportion to what we do. Pigs, for example, they're about our, our same size. A big pig is 100 kilos when it's slaughtered. Um, that pig eats five times more than we do. That pig is putting on three pounds a day in weight. So, so it's extreme what we're doing here. So that consumption of those 90 billion animals is way more than the consumption of the, uh, of the humans. And this gives you an idea of what that is. This is the mammals on Earth. This is from the mice up to elephants and whales. And let's see how that pans out. Humans make up a third of the mammals by, by weight. This is by biomass weight. Farmed animals make up 60% of the weight of mammals on Earth. Pets, by the way, are less than 1%. But what have we done to wildlife? This is, this is uh, all of those wild animals, including the whales, the elephants, the giraffes, the hippos, the rhinos, um, the, 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 uh, um, all of the big mammals that are wild make up just 4% of mammals on Earth. 
So we have squeezed these guys into a corner. We have taken their habitat and, and habitat to wild animals is everything. So take away the habitat, we take away the, the, the populations. So let's talk about biodiversity loss. At the moment, the, um, the, the, the scientific literature is talking about the sixth mass extinction on planet Earth. We, we, are, we are now, uh, species are going extinct now um, much faster than they ever have. Um, we, we've lost at least 68% of wildlife populations. We've lost at least half the plants and half the fish. Um, more about that later. And the, the language in the science journals is bordering on, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a lot more emotive than it ever used to be. Um, the window for effective action is very short. We're now losing species a thousand times faster than any time in the last 10,000 years. What's driving it? Cattle farming is the greatest driver of biodiversity loss, purely because we're taking habitat for cattle farming. 80% of agricultural land is devoted to livestock and feed, and meat is the biggest threat to wildlife. There's many references on this now, guys. Lots of information. Nutrient pollution. This is we've we, this is way overstepped the limits. Reactive nitrogen and phosphorus also, they they strip the oxygen in the water and make it acidic. So it's the single, it's considered the single greatest coastal water and air polluter. And what causes that? Well, meat production is the leading cause of nitrogen pollution in the USA. There's now three to 400 ocean dead zones from nitrogen pollution. This is a map of those. The red dots are the ocean dead zones. And the, the blue uh, gradient colors in the open ocean show you areas of the open ocean that are going hypoxic. They're losing their oxygen. So in past mass extinctions, the loss of oxygen in the oceans has been equated with the mass extinction. And that's exactly what's happening now. So what causes it? It's waste, believe it or not. Um, the nitrogen comes from uh, uh, fertilizers, okay? We, we pull, literally pull nitrogen fertilizer out of thin air. Out of, it, the, the, the air is mostly made up of not nitrogen. So we, we take that and that's inactive. We take that, we make it reactive and we make fertilizer out of it. And that fertilizer is, is growing feed crops and those feed crops are feeding animals. So most of the, or half of the crops on earth feed animals, about a quarter feed humans. The rest is cotton and uh, biofuel. So when we, when we uh, produce chicken meat, chicken's the most efficient meat. But when we produce chicken meat, we waste 80% of the nutrient, the, the, of the nitrogen, of the protein in that, in that uh, nitrogen fertilizer. So it's like lining up five plates of pasta in front of us, eating one and throwing the other four plates in the rubbish. Pork is, is the same. We waste 85%. When we eat beef, we waste 96%. So those, what's wasted is the nutrients, the protein. And those nutrients enter the system and pollute the system. And this is the worst pollution on earth. Fresh water. We are in a perilous state. Um, by 2030, the world, that's <laughs> just around the corner, we'll need 40% more water. 84% of cropland will have less water due to climate change, that's natural water. And this is the face of, of water security, the refugees. Uh, Syria, for example, when they had that great refugee crisis in Europe, that was all driven by the millennial drought and the Syrian farmers not having any other means of support. They, there's, no, there's drought on year on year on year they had no crops, they had no food, they had no reserves. So what do they do? They've got to get up and walk. So 
refugees, and we've had more than 20 million climate refugees per year since 2008. Most of those are refugees within the same continent, like in Africa, they, they move to another region that still has food. But, but some of them, and this is causing uh, uh, conflict all around the world. Um, where does the water go? We know. It takes 2,400 litres to produce a hamburger, beef hamburger. It takes 25 litres to produce a potato. The, the difference is just yeah, no, no comparison. Overfishing has wiped out 90% of the fish we eat. Uh, bottom trawling has ploughed continental shelves, destroying ecosystems. And, and this, is a, <laughs> this is a really interesting story. They had a, um, a global ocean commission. <laughs> uh, it was set up um, uh, uh, about uh, 10 years ago. It was set up to, to look at the, the state of the oceans and to make recommendations on sustainable fishing. Well, guess what? It produced this one big report, and the report was so damning that they shut the commission down. This is really funny. So anyway, this is, this is a graphic in that report showing the fishing fleet, which has grown 10 times since the 1950s, but the catch has actually gone down 50%. So... Um, in, in other words, we've got bigger and better fishing capacity and we've got less and less fish to fish. <laughs> so this is, you know, this is a, 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 uh, it's a it's, it's just humanity. We are so crazy. Climate tipping points. This is uh, recent research that uh, looks at we are on the verge of a number of tipping points. Tipping points are when... Um, things happen non-linearly, like you, we might be sailing along, we might gradual, gradual temperature increase, and then all of a sudden it takes off. Well, this is these are mostly to do with water, and, and a lot of them are to do with uh, ice and snow, and they've already tipped, so, uh, some of them, but uh, we're reaching many tippy points. And there's been a lot of research on this now, but they say that food Will, will push us into dangerous global warming, even if carbon dioxide is cut to zero. In other words, if we can have clean energy for the world, for everything, we replace every fossil fuel, we will still go into dangerous climate change if we have food business as usual. The highest impact climate solution, and there's many programs that look at these, there's there's uh, natural climate solutions, there's project drawdown, there's, there's many others that look at what on earth we can do to reduce the, uh, greenhouse gases and to draw down greenhouse gases, the most effective thing we can do is to grow vegetation. And what, what we've found is that if we rewild 41% of pastures, that's not even half the, but, but the, what, what that is, is the grazing land covers, it, it's the biggest land use of all on planet Earth. It covers 37% of the land. And 41% of that used to be forest. If we reforest, if we take that back and rewild that to forest again, we can draw down um, uh, as, as much carbon as has been emitted. And this is uh, uh, some work I did a little while ago on, on regenerative grazing. Um, what is the potential of, of uh, regenerating carbon in grazing soils? Well, this is it on the left-hand side. That's the potential. Um, uh, if, we, if we turn all the world's grazing efforts into regenerative grazing and and, re and uh, take those soils back to their pristine carbon condition, this is the answer. So it's, it's very little. If we take the world's crop soils and do the same, take them back to, to their original carbon condition, this is what we get. Crop soils are much more degraded than grazing soils because we turn the soil over with the plough and, and so liberate the carbon dioxide. But if we, if we reforest, the, the grazing lands, what used to be forest, this is the potential. It's, the, it's, a, it's, it's a, 
it's two orders of magnitude more than the grazing soils. And and as as a as an exercise, I I, I did the num. I found out the uh, research on if we reforest all the built up land, if we if we disappear all of the uh, cities of the world and the built up land, the transport, etc. What will that give for us? Well, this is it. It's a small proportion of of rewilding the grazing land because the grazing land covers thirty seven percent of the planet. It's huge whereas cities cover 1%. So that's why they're different. And the food we get from grazing lands, uh, ruminants, including dairy, most of them are, are, are lot fed, by the way, but um, that provides 14% of our protein. Now, if we look at the, the, pro the food we get from just the, the animals fed on grass alone, it's 1% of our protein. So we are squandering over a third of the planet for 1% of our protein. This is extreme waste where, where that same land could pull us out of the climate crisis. And we know that rewilding grazing lands is the lowest cost, largest scale climate fix there is, and it's cheap. We know that a vegan diet reduces land use by 3 billion hectares, huge. And this is an example, it's, it's just one example of um, what we need to do to reduce our meat consumption, to bring it in line with sustainable future on this planet. And this is a WWF report, um, but this means that all of that consumption up here must reduce, to the, this is from 2010 to 2030, must reduce to uh, a, about uh, a quarter of what it was. And in developed nations, that's actually a reduction of more than 90%. So um, we, are we on track to that? No way. So these are the different areas what, where sustainable consumption has been studied. If we, if we want sustainable consumption for climate, we need to replace red meat and dairy. If we want Biodiversity loss, if we want to give wildlife a chance, we need to replace all meat. If we want water security, we need to replace 75% of meat. If we want to stop deforestation, we need to replace 50 to 93% of meat. If we want to stop the nitrogen nutrient pollution, we replace 50% of meat and dairy. If we want to stop the, the uh, zoonotic diseases, the ones that transfer from wild animals to humans, we need to replace all meat and give them back their space. If we want to ocean ecosystem health again, we need to replace seafood. And if we want human health, we need to replace 50% red meat and sugar. That's the eat lancet. So that's the end of that. I've, I've actually talked about um, a little bit of research that we did um, uh, recently on, on climate that's going to come out in the peer-reviewed literature soon. And I'll, and I'll delve into that very quickly. But, but Jonathan Foley, the guy who, um, uh, who runs um, uh, a project Drawdown, this is a major international project to um, many, many different facets, facets to look at, at, at uh, how we can soak up carbon dioxide. And he says things happen very, very, very slowly and then all at once. And I believe that's what's going to happen here because many of us have now felt the effects of say climate change we've felt the floods of the fires but all of us will feel the, the heat so to speak very soon and we'll decide okay let's do something about this and this is my logo eat plants plant trees i've got it on my on my shirt here my daughter-in-law made it up for me she's a treasure um okay I, i'll i won't go into that this is uh a few things there Okay, this is the work that we're doing now. We're proposing a whole new uh, greenhouse gas accounting framework. Um, you see, there's some basic flaws. There's some, there's some huge inconsistencies in the way that we account for emissions. And in this diagram, you see that these are the biggest sources of carbon dioxide. Firstly, you've all heard of fossil fuel carbon dioxide. Okay, well, the second biggest source of carbon dioxide is deforestation and other land use like fire. So 
and logging, that sort of thing. So how do we account for that carbon dioxide that's emitted? Well, for fossil fuels, we count all of it. We count 100% of it. But for deforestation emissions, we count 28% of it, and we and we say that okay, the rest of it, the the other um, the other 62% is actually absorbed by other vegetation that's regrowing. So therefore, we'll only count the net of those two, the the emission minus the drawdown. <laughs> but the thing is that fossil fuels, when they're emitted, more than half of that is actually taken up by vegetation, exactly the same as what happens to deforestation emissions. So when you, when you do the sums again with consistent accounting for both fossil fuel carbon dioxide and deforestation carbon dioxide, deforestation in, increases dramatically. The, the amount of emissions from deforestation is four times more than fossil fuels. And, and uh, how does that compare? What, what difference does that make? Well, this is a diagram of how the conventional climate accounting goes. You've got this diagram and it starts at 1750. And, and the orange in this diagram is the emissions from fossil fuels. You can see that it's been going up rapidly in the last few decades. And the emissions from land use is here in the in the greenish colour, and that's uh, uh, starts at seventeen fifty. Whoops, um, that starts at seventeen fifty, and it continues up, and it looks like it's about uh, a third more, or half half again on top of fossil fuels. That's the standard story that we hear, but here on the right hand side is the real story. The real story is that fossil fuels don't change. That's the same as the last one. But the, the emissions from, from uh, deforestation are now four times more, three and a half times more than they used to be. So that doesn't just start at 1750, that starts way back. And if you look at the cumulative uh, deforestation emissions, it's way up here. So you can see that what has caused the greatest warming of planet Earth, it's not fossil fuels, up until now, it's not fossil fuels, it's deforestation. And this is the, uh, this is the conclusions that we're coming out with now. This will be peer-reviewed, peer by the way, and uh, it's going to create quite a stir. So therefore, the industries... The, the, on, on land that used to be forests have the greatest carbon dioxide impact because those industries have caused the deforestation that, um, uh, for, to produce that land they, they now use. Um, the other things we do is we uh, compare sectors uh, with effective radiative forcing, not global warming potential. That, that's produced a lot of arguments. And we, and we look at all emissions, the heating and the cooling emissions. And um, uh, this is probably too much for some, most of you, but um, you see here that this is the, on the left-hand side, this is fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels have warming from ca carbon dioxide, from methane, from uh, carbon monoxide, from uh, CFCs, etc. They also have cooling from sulfur dioxide and from um, nitrogen oxides and organic carbons. Um, and, and that cooling, when you subtract that from the heating, it, it takes away a lot of the heating. So um, the, the net effect of warming from fossil fuels is this one here. Whereas animal agriculture, it's, it has some cooling gases, yes, but most of it is warming. So uh, particularly when you look at the, the real uh, emissions from, from deforestation. So animal agriculture comes out at the leading cause of climate change with just over half uh, the emissions. 
And um, working on IPCC values, uh, if we add up those emissions and it works out that global animal agriculture has caused uh, 0.6 of a degree centigrade warming. Uh, I won't go into that. Um, and that's about that. Um, yeah, okay, you can. Uh, Here I come. Yeah. Wow. That was amazing. That's a lot to take in. It is, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. It's like, I mean, it, it's really, really sad. It's hard to, I mean, it, it's just so big and it, you can, we can really, I mean, you feel that impact on those animals that have no choice. I mean, that's it. Where do they go? It's, it's amazing that we take away habitat so easily without thought to any of their lives. And then we think that it's not going to come back to hurt us. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, I, I left government in the end because uh, some of my staff were actually working on a, a, a report that was greenwashing the Queensland beef industry. So I left in, uh, in disgust at that. But, but over that time, those decades that I was working on satellite imagery and the, with the government, we witnessed, um, uh, every day, two and a half thousand acres of forest taken out for beef production. Two and a half thousand acres per day, every day, for 30 years. <laughs> That's incredible. I can't even, I can't wrap my head around that. Oh, it is. It's, it's frightening. Um, it, it's it, it, just staggering. I mean, this is the industrial scale. De uh, trashing of the planet purely for grass-fed industries so when when people say that grass-fed industries are, are the way to go you know this is the more natural this is the best food we can eat because it's grass-fed and the land is not useful for anything else it's such rubbish i mean the, the amount of destruction for grass-fed industries is extreme and and um that land is extremely valuable, not for producing beef or sheep. It's, it's valuable for growing trees. <laughs> so um, that can save us. That can give habitat back to wildlife and it can soak up the carbon dioxide. This is, this is the solution we've got. So it's a very simple solution. And as I said in that Jonathan Foley slide, uh, you know, things can happen very quickly. Um, we, we, we are at a perilous state, we humans, and, and this solution, which I believe is the only real solution out there, the technology hasn't gone anywhere, but this solution is practical, it's large scale, it's low cost, and it can be done now. And all it depends on is you and I and a bunch of others changing their diet. And we, so we can do that, we're already doing that. I know you are already doing that big time but this is so it's it's necessary for the animals definitely but it's also necessary for our future and our grandkids future on this planet if we want them to have a habitable planet we need to change what we eat it's not too many human mouths to feed it's too many animal mouths to feed that's the problem we can support if if we if we all went plant-based, if we all went vegan, this planet, the, the crop areas on this planet could support another half the population as what we have now. We'd have a 50% surplus of food. If we stop the wastage by feeding animals and then eating animals. And, and the wastage of land, the wasting of, wastage of nutrients, wastage of water, the wastage of, of um, uh, you know, uh, land that could be drawing down carbon dioxide and providing habitat. So it's a very simple solution. It's a, it's like a, uh, a a Swiss Army knife. It does everything. <laughs> <laughs> right, you're right. It, it does everything. I mean, it. This is affecting. Oh my gosh, it, it's it's affecting everything. Um, so let me get some comments here. I think this is Stacy Anderson. How does the deforestation of Queensland measure with the deforestation of the Brazil forests? 
Um, okay, in area, about uh, a bit more than half, but um, in density, um, the, the forests in Queensland that we we're mostly mapping was uh, what they'd call um, woodland, not not dense, 100% uh, canopy forest, not rainforest. Um, in Brazil, it's in the Amazon, it's it's mostly rainforest, but in the southern Brazil, the Cerrado, it's 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 about the same as what it, what we have in Queensland. Most of the most of the uh, clearing is done by bulldozer and chain. Um, whereas in the in the rainforest, they go in first, take out the logs, take out the lumber. It's a bit of quick cash, and that allows them to start the burning program, uh, which they need to do to turn it into uh, pasture. So yeah, it's Australia is considered one of the main deforestation fronts by the WWF. So we're a first world country, but we've got third world deforestation it's still going on right now at that same level, two and a half thousand acres per day. And that's just our neck of the woods. That's not, uh, that's my state, not even the whole of Australia. Um, and it's, and it's, uh, it's not even South, South America. It's, it's just dramatic. It's, it's crazy. It is very crazy. Yes, you're right. Um, let me see here. We've got another comment. What do you think of Bill Gates coming out with his statement that animal agriculture is the largest contributor to climate change? Yeah, he's spot on. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, our research will show that. Our research shows that by devaluing um, deforestation emissions, which we have been doing, if we if we account for them uh, consistently with other emissions such as fossil fuels, then then deforestation has actually been producing three and a half times more carbon dioxide than we measured. So um, yes, it, it's uh, when you do that and you do the sums and you do the the uh, uh, you know counting backwards to see cumulative emissions. In other words, what has caused global warming up to now. Why are we experiencing this 1.2 degrees of global warming now? And that's being caused not by the emissions from last year, it's by all of the emissions going right back. So when you do those sums, you find that animal agriculture, yes, it's caused uh, half half the global warming to date. So it's, uh, he's right. Um, and and even without our research, he's right. <laughs> I mean, Curtis <laughs> Rowe has put out that paper some time ago, and he includes he includes another factor called the carbon opportunity cost. Now that is it, that works like this: the land that that is used for grazing land, it could be used for growing trees. If it were used for growing trees, what would that impact? How would that impact climate? And you can calculate that, and we've done that as well. And when you do that, um, it it takes animal agriculture up way more. In in fact, it takes animal agriculture to about 120 percent of emissions. In other words, that's drawdown potential. It's more than 100 percent. It's it's it can reverse global warming if you shut down that industry. So yeah, right. it's it's. Uh, it's grazing industries, but also the the extreme waste of all animal foods is something that we just cannot support any longer uh, uh, on this planet. It's 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 not one thing. It's not just the deforestation. It's not just climate. It's not just biodiversity loss. It's not just nutrient pollution. It's not just lack of water. <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> It goes on and on and on. It, it, these these things are all connected, but um, they're all telling us the same thing. Life on Earth is is threatened. It's perilous right now. If we continue to do business as usual, we're we're in for a big shock, and you know our our grandkids won't have the life that we've had unless we change. Yes, you're right. Exactly. Here's another question. What are novel entities? 
novel entities. Yeah, these are the um, persistent pollutants, the PCBs, and the uh, uh, they get into the water. They the plastics that, that get into the system, um, the microplastics that that are now in in a lot of plants, in a lot of people, um, from our toothpaste, from all sorts of um, uh, sources. But but uh, yes, those. We don't know what effect they're going to have long term, and that's why, um, in, in those novel en in that that planetary boundaries that says novel entities, um, it's only just been measured and it's been measured inside the green, but that's the very first measurement of that. No doubt there'll be other science re research that comes out that looks at that again and says, "No, I don't think so. I think it's I think we're we're gone." Um, so, so yeah, we're, 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 th these things are not static. The, the science is continually working at these issues and continually finding um, new things. Like, uh, for example, the, the um, species loss has just been discovered. It's, it's in some areas 30 times faster than what we've thought. So, um, yeah, uh, we're in a hell of a state. Um, deforestation, um, degradation they call it, it's where they go in and they selectively log or they clear small areas. Uh, that is producing twice as much emissions as we thought. So, um, you know, every time the science comes in, uh, <laughs> the picture gets worse, basically. They, they just had a major, major uh, United Nations meeting on biodiversity for the world and they looked at all of the targets that they had set from the last meeting which is about a decade before and how many of those targets have are they meeting zero yeah. so so um and and are they on track to meet any of those targets no so <laughs> you know um it's 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 the more the science comes in, the more perilous it looks for us. But, but, but I think that, you know, humanity is, is slow, but not stupid. Like, eventually we'll see these things. Eventually we'll see that um, we are um, trashing the thing that gives us life, which is the biosphere, planet Earth. Um, how long can we keep uh, exploiting natural resources? You know, how long can we keep cutting down trees? How long can we use the ocean as a, uh, a sewage dump ah. and, and, and the land for that matter? Um, you know, um, it may, it, it just, just a couple of generations ago, if you were clearing the land, you would, that was seen as a, as a good thing for your family, your community, for your nation, to feed the world. This was, this was seen as a very good thing. But now we can see, oh, oh, it, it's, it's damage. It's, it's not quite as resilient as we thought it was. Nature is not so um, big and uh, tough as we thought it was. And it's fragile. And, and we, we need to adjust our thinking every tree is precious every forest is so valuable for climate for biodiversity for water cycles uh, for, for uh, soaking up the uh, pollution etc so we will get this we are slow but we're not stupid and when it when it starts to hit each one of us personally and there's still like around me now there's been uh, we had uh, extended drought and we had extended rain and there's people who've been flooded out of their homes. That was two years ago and they're still living in, in, in caravans, in, in temporary accommodation. So, and there's people living in their cars now, you know, it's, it's um, the homeless. Uh, it, it, these people have been impacted by the flood that took away their home. They have experienced climate change. They have experienced the negative results of, of our trashing of our planet. So 
when we start to link these things together, which we are, then we will come to our senses, I believe. It, um, yeah. And 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 as as Sailor Shrau plotted, it's brilliant actually what he did. He plotted uh, deforestation. He plotted biodiversity loss, and he also plotted the number of vegans in the world, and they all turn exponential. In other words, um, when you're on an exponential curve, you look back about what's been happening, and it doesn't seem that much has changed. It seems business as usual. You look forward and it's off the chart. So in other words, Sandish Rouse predicting that by 2026, the world will go vegan. I think he's about right. Uh, and and what will happen is that by the end of 2025, even the beginning of 2026, it will still look like very little's happening. But by the end of the year, whoosh, everyone will be changing from, um, oh, how can you, how can you not eat meat? It's just so delicious. Oh yeah, um, they'll be changing from that to, oh, how could you eat meat? Oh yeah, um, it, that that change of attitude is it happens in the blink of an eye. You've seen these, uh, um, you know, TikTok things that that change kids' attitudes like that. Uh, we're so influenced. We, we we humans are so easily influenced. So if we take away the meat meat advertising for a bit um, and put up some other influence, we will change so quickly, so quickly. Oh, I'm ready for that. I'm definitely ready for that. Let's see. All right, we got another question. Isn't there a danger in emphasizing grazing and then encouraging feedlots and factory farms for the continued eating of animals? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm I'm emphasizing the dangers of grazing, but I'm also emphasizing the dangers of feedlots. Um, uh, the 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 people who advocate, you know. Uh, uh, grass-fed industries um, are also advocating for deforestation they're advocating for use of that land uh, to, to for all sorts of nasty things there isn't enough land to eat eat uh, grass-fed anything but but factory farming is it's well it's just the logical extension of the capitalist system of pushing the profit margins and uh, uh, producing lowest cost food, but at extreme expense of the environment, extreme expense. You might have heard of those uh, farmer revolts in the Netherlands recently. They had pictures of uh, farmers leading convoys of tractors into town. Uh, they're taking away our animals. Now, um, and, and, and people like Russell Brand got behind that. And, and but the real situation was this: they've known for decades in Europe that pouring the the nutrients, particularly from dairy farming, pouring those nutrients into the waterways is killing the waterways. And the only way to to, to uh, reduce it is to reduce the number of animals. There's no technical solution, none. So um, they know that, and that's been on the agenda the political agenda for decades. Now, no government until now has had the guts to say, OK, we're going to start this move. and We've got to reduce the animal numbers. And when they started doing that, they, they offer uh, ample compensation, by the way. But when they start reducing animal numbers, it's not the farmers so much as the, the uh, advocates for meat eating who jump on that bandwagon and beat it up into something and pay farmers to join protests to and and take you know uh, video shots of this to make it look more than it really is um so so that's that's the situation there that factory farming is killing the rivers they know it um but but factory farm like that example i gave of pigs i've just uh i can't believe pigs. <laughs> we have bred pigs to grow in five months to grow from a baby piglet 
into a 100 kilo, kilogram animal, same size as a big, big male, 100 kilos in five months. They're putting on 1.7 kilos of meat and fat per day. They're eating five times more than we eat. So for every one pig, we looked at a, a piggery near, oh, not far, 100,000 pigs, 140 actually, 140,000 pigs. Now, if each pig is, is producing five times the effluent of a human, that means that, um, and they're eating five times the food, that means that um, we're, we're up to 700,000 people. So, so this is a fairly big town, so a quarter of, three quarters of a million people. Now, if you had a town that size and you had uh, your, your sewerage run out into ponds and just left there, there'd be a huge upcry, outcry about that. But that's exactly what, what is done for all the world's piggeries. They pump it into these lagoons. They might have agitators to, to get the oxygen in there to, to break it down quicker. But every time it rains, every time there's a bit of a leak in the system, that, you, that it's toxic. This is why whenever there's a flood, uh, the, the authorities tell you, the, the floodwaters are toxic, don't go into the floodwaters. And that's the reason, because it's full of animal effluent and the, and the you know, the salmonella, etc. that comes with that. So all of that enters the, the, uh, the, the environment. The, the amount of effluent from the animals that we're producing is, is, is a strong argument there alone to stop that. But the amount of food that we need to give them is, is also a strong argument. You know, we're, we're, we're pulling nitrogen fertilizer out of thin air. This is what supported the green revolution. We got so good at agriculture, so productive at agriculture that um, we, could, we could do this. And, and we thought the nature was limitless, so we just kept going. But now we know that we're polluting like crazy and you know like the oceans for example that we, we've been we've been uh, bottom trawling you know for prawns for these small fish the world's continental shelves have been stripped of their ecosystems by these bottom trawlers <laughs> you know what does that do to an ecosystem and, and we've been we're using the ocean as our trash can uh, for our our toxic uh, industrial waste as well as animal waste forever so you know we we just can't keep doing that um there, there's so many things wrong with this uh, chickens are the are the most efficient meat of all but there we're wasting 80 percent of the of the food that we give them how can we how can we accept that that's just so grossly wasteful um you know, with more people on the planet which are coming, uh, we can't. We just can't support it, and and that's that's what it is. We we are reaching hard limits to the Earth's capacity to support. It. We're beyond the limits, but we're drawing down our savings to the point where we'll have no savings left. And once we hit the hit the save, have no savings left, we go bankrupt. So we we flip those. Uh, uh, those those uh, planetary boundaries into a, a, a new state. We hit a tipping point, and that system breaks down. And that system is the system that we discover supported life on Earth. So you know this is this is the point that we're at. We're at a critical time for humanity. This is, and and I think it's it's um, it's exciting. This point in history is so exciting we have the opportunity to undo the the problems that we've been causing for millennia and and wow wouldn't it be great if we can be a part of that which we are i mean anyone who eats vegan is is making a big step towards that influencing so many other people even though they're critical they they take it on board Right. Yes, and we have to do it. Can, do we have time for one more question? 
do you have time for one more question? Let's see. Oh, here's yeah, the, sure, 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 okay. Sure. All right. Here's <laughs> let's do the last one. All right. Here's from VJ. Is there a number? Or a percentage, we could say that deforestation is more than fossil fuels. Twice the amount of carbon. Uh, three and a half times. Oh, well, sorry. Um, okay. Um, what's something simple? Okay, cumulative. Up until now, what's causing global warming right now? The amount of uh, carbon dioxide emitted by deforestation is four times greater and the amount of carbon dioxide emitted by fossil fuels up until now. Into the future, um, the, the fossil fuel emissions are really taking off. So that mix will change in the future. In another 50 years, um, it could be, uh, you know, two to one. But um, we, we've been deforestating, we've been deforesting the world for 10,000 years. And, and if you, that accumulates, accumulated is four times greater than for current fossil fuels. Cumulated. Wow, all right. It well. it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not simple, it's not, um, uh, yeah. But it is we got a lot to study, we got a lot to learn. So you've been, yeah, this has been amazing. And we got BJ saying excellent talk and imperative that we need make good choices and deb is also saying thank you no, very excellent kind presentation yeah and I, i'm really um grateful wow for everything that you've shared with us jar um did you have any final comments and we let us know where we can find your information and reach out to you yeah okay um well the um the the, the climate healers website of course there's um Eating Our Way to Extinction uh, website is, is a good resource as well. I actually wrote a book to go with the uh, documentary. Um, it's a, it's a, a coffee table book, it's a monster, but it's still <laughs> only about $30 or something. It's, and it's been beautifully produced. And half of the book is environment, that's the part I wrote. The other half is on the interviews around health. So uh, very interesting work there. Um, and and there's on that website there's um, food for the future and there's a, 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 a section in there about MythBusters which is really interesting to read. Um, but the other thing that I do is the World Preservation Foundation and I've, we've got a YouTube channel and a bunch of videos there. I did explaining Salish Rao's um, climate uh, climate impact work. So, um, yeah, right. so uh, that's, that's and so, it. What's the name of the YouTube channel? Um, World Preservation Foundation. Okay, so please subscribe to that. Please subscribe to this channel if you're enjoying this. I mean, I don't know how you couldn't be. <laughs> so, and um, thank you for reminding about eating our way to extinction. That was so shocking. I had to watch it in parts because I could only digest a little bit at a time. You know, yeah. but yeah, yeah, you know, yes, I feel like my focus has always been animals. And now I feel like since I've, we've, we've spent this month on climate, I thought, my gosh, <laughs> I need to learn more about climate. So this has been just so impactful. And I really want to thank you for coming to speak with us. Thank yeah. you, Margarita. Yeah, it's been a great pleasure. And um, I must congratulate you guys who are in the trenches out there doing the activist work that uh, many of us uh, sit back and applaud, but but don't get into. So uh, your work is so, so valuable. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks everybody for watching, Stacy, Deb, um, Tiffany and BJ and everyone else that's here that I don't know if you're watching on the replay and um, check, check out all these links and um, really appreciate you and keep up the good work, y'all. So, all right, well, thank you everybody. And I'll just say, Namaste vegan, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.